Hi, thanks for watching today. Today we'll be talking about effective practice methods. Not exactly what you do inside the practice room, but what goes on inside your head while you practice. How the brain reacts to your practicing. I'm Jeff Barbee, a doctoral candidate in euphonium performance at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, as well as a recent graduate in the Masters of Arts in Higher, Edu Higher Education Administration program. Here is a brief list of the topics we'll be talking about today. We'll be talking about long and short-term memory, as well as the synaptic cleft, uh, brain plasticity, uh, brain pruning, uh, myelin consolidation, and the rest and offline period. You may ask, why should we talk about this? Well, studies have shown that students who understand what goes on during the learning process um, retain information better than students who don't. And so I figure, why not understand the learning process and perhaps improve the results of our practice? The first aspect of um, learning is, is our short-term memory. Short-term memory is also known as your working memory, uh, memory that you're dealing with right now such as the decision to watch this video, um, or information such as telephone numbers or locker combinations. Basically bits of information that are important right now at this very moment. Coupled with our short-term memory is long-term memory. Uh, long-term memory is divided up into two different types of long-term memory. First we'll talk about our declarative memory, also known as our explicit memory. And this is also divided into two sections, such as uh, major life events and information that you cannot trace back to when you first learned. Uh, examples of declarative memory is uh, maybe a wedding day or a day where you were involved in a major car accident, and also uh, information such as your ABCs, one, two, threes, and even learning your name. Uh, it's believed that this information is stored in the hippocampus of the brain, which is when needed, that's where it's recalled from. The other aspect of long-term memory is our non-declarative memory, also known as procedural memory. This deals with information such as walking, riding a bicycle, um, perhaps even, or well, hopefully, our scales. You may ask, how do these two types of long-term memory work together? Well, Think of your daily drive to work or school. This is mostly procedural memory where you're really not thinking about it. You wake up, you get in your car, uh, you drive or you, or you pedal away to work. Um, now think of the last time you were at perhaps a conference and you woke up from a hotel and you had to go to a building that you had never been to before. Your procedural memory is dealing with you driving the car. Gas pedal means go, stop sign means stop. Your non-declarative memory is making the conscious decisions of where to make turns, uh, where to park the vehicle. Now, if you were to make this drive enough over and over over time, eventually all of the memory that's used in the non-declarative sense becomes part of the procedural memory where you're not really thinking about it. So when you learn new skills, you're really not starting from scratch. You're building off skills that you had previously learned. So this is a combination of both your, your declarative and non-declarative memory. So I like to use the example of scales, etudes, uh, solos. Think back to when you first learned your B-flat scale, then you had an etude in the key of B-flat. The skills you had learned such as B-flat and E-flat will transfer over to this etude. And maybe the etude has some technical difficulties that would be related to uh, a solo in B-flat. So this is a constant layering on top of one another to, to build the skills that you have today. Um, here is a, an example of a piece. Um, your non-declarative memory is looking at notes. You know that a whole note is worth four counts, or you know the rhythm of eighth notes or dotted eighth notes. Your declarative memory is figuring out how these pieces work together to make that certain phrase. Um, I used to believe that information that we learned over time was kind of stored in our brain like a Word document, but that is far from true. Uh, the different aspects and information from, this, from these experiences are broken down and stored in the appropriate aspects of the brain. So here is a picture of the outside of the human brain. Um, the different color areas are known as cortices or a cortex. 
Um, we have in the red the motor cortex, uh, the blues are sensory cortex. Underneath here we have our cerebellum as well as our visual cortex and our auditory cortex is stored right there in the middle. So a breakdown of what these cortexes do or cortices do. Uh, visual deals with sight, uh, motor deals with our motor functions, sensory deals with what we feel, auditory is what we hear, the prefrontal cortex or the cortex in front of our brain is where our expectations and satisfactions, our satisfactions are, are set. Our cerebellum is kind of a simple brain on its own and it deals mostly with motor functions. So once again, here is the chart of the brain. Uh, interesting fact, the Broca's area here on the left deals mostly with language. Uh, if you grew up in a bi-language uh, household or you picked up a language before the age of seven, this area deals with both those languages. If you're like myself and trying to learn a language later in life, your brain will actually adapt a new area dedicated to that language. It's believed that the left side of the brain is uh, the primary area where language is dealt with. Uh, if we look back on our uh, motor and sensory cortices, um, they are made of a, a section called the homunculus. And what this homunculus is, it controls the different aspects, the cells and uh, different parts of our body. So here is a chart kind of representing um, the number of cells dedicated to each uh, parts of the body. If you were to squeeze your elbow really hard right now, you would notice that you hardly feel anything. Now, if you were to take the same amount of pressure and squeeze your lower lip, you would feel that it, it is extremely painful. And that is because there are more neurons dedicated to your face and lip than in your elbow. Uh, the cerebellum, we talked about earlier, the back part of the brain. Uh, this deals with motor functions such as walking, shooting a basketball, kicking a football. Um, it's very easy to lose uh, focus in a warm up because some of them may be just be uh, motor processes that kick in and your body does it without actually thinking about it. Uh, it's also believed that over time, this area of the brain has developed the ability to trigger emotional responses. Uh, the cortex has six different layers. Uh, we've heard the, the, gray, the gray matter and white matter being talked about. The outside of, or the upper uh, layers of the cortex, this is where the gray matter. Uh, at this point in the brain, this is where the cortex communicates with just itself. As you dig deeper into the cortex, you find more white matter. And this is where the cortices uh, communicate with one another. Underneath the cortex, you have uh, this, basically the parts of the brain that make up the central nervous system. Uh, the important parts are the corpus callosum, which is what connects the two sides of the brain, the left and right hemisphere. Uh, you have the amygdala, which is what I consider the fear center. Um, if you had a extremely frightening experience, uh, such as maybe a, a car accident at a certain intersection of town or you're walking down a dark alley late at night in a shady part of part of town, your amygdala will kick in and say, this is a time to be uh, fear, to have fear, um, get out of there. Your hippocampus uh, serves as a, a memory broker. Um, if your short term memory is using information enough, eventually your hippocampus will say, hey, this is important. We need to keep this so it's easily, so it's easy to be recalled upon later. Here is a chart of what a neuron is made of. Um, it used to be thought that the human brain had close to 100 billion of these, but new research shows that we have only 60 billion, which is still a lot. This is the main, this is the main picture of what the neuron looks like. Over here, over here, you have your dendrites, which is where information is sent into the cell. Here is your cell body, which will determine if the information needs to be sent through to the next neuron. Right here we have our, our hallock area, which if action potential reaches its threshold will be sent down through the axon, which will be sent out through the axon terminals to the next neuron. Uh, as you can see right here, what looks like sausage, 
This is known as myelin, and this will kick the information quicker. Uh, myelin is kind of a speed insulator. It serves as a, a boost area to send the neurotransmitters through the cell quicker to the brain. Um, it builds up over time with more repetitions. So as you practice a scale over and over again, the, the neural pathway, what I like to call, will build up and the myelin will build up to help send these signals faster through the brain. Uh, this, uh, this substance becomes more difficult to obtain and begins to deteriorate after the age of 50, especially if you, if you do not use it. Um, how the information is sent from one neuron to the next is through the synapse. And it will look like in a picture, I think the next slide, where the synapses touch the axon to the dendrite, there's actually a gap. And what happens is that neurotransmitters are sent from the presynaptic, which is the, the axon terminal, from one neuron to the postsynapse, which is the dendrites of the next cell. So here is a chart. As I said earlier, it looks like they connect, but there's actually a small gap between there. Um, the presynaptic um, terminal is the, is the axon from the cell sending the information, and the postsynapse is the dendrite that's receiving the information. So here, when you have a cell, the cell is polarized, meaning that it's, it's just kind of in a, a neutral state. Uh, neurotransmitters will either send a, a signal to depolarize the cell, meaning for it to fire, or a inhibitory signal, which, deep, which hyperpolarizes the cell, meaning that it's, it's extremely lazy. Um, this process deals with what's known as the action potential. It's a very interesting and, and fascinating aspect. With more repetition and more neurotransmitters being sent over time, um, the dendrites um, sprout what's known as dendrite sp uh, spines. And this helps the neuron take in the neurotransmitters faster. It helps for a faster reaction time throughout. The dendrite spines actually will sprout and connect with other nearby neurons, which helps send electrical signals faster. Um, chemical signals, really won't have much of an effect on this, but the dendrite spines will connect with other neurons, meaning that it doesn't need the chemical reactions to, to fire. Uh, the chemical reactions are a little bit slower because of what goes on, whereas the electrical uh, transmissions are just simpler and easier because they're, they're already connected. Uh, brain plasticity is what our brain does over time as we practice and learn new skills. So if you're learning a new scale or a new solo, your brain will actually adjust to recall this information at a much quicker, much easier pace. Um, this is very, very important for musicians as we're constantly learning new solos, new etudes for, for uh, recitals and whatnot. As you begin learning a new piece of music, there's oftentimes going to be mistakes. And that's because of you just not knowing the piece as well. So anytime you make a mistake, a neural pathway is sent that's incorrect. But if you were to practice it over time the incorrect way, this, this pathway would strengthen. But if you practice it correctly, the correct neural pathways will strengthen and the incorrect ways will actually die away from not being used. Um, like myself back in the day and many college students today, they do not get enough sleep. And what happens during sleep is a process called consolidation. And what happens is that your neocortex will retrace the steps and the information that you learned through the day down to the hippocampus and back. This process takes five or six hours to do, five to six hours to complete. Um, if you don't get this amount of sleep, the process is incomplete and it almost serves as if you didn't practice or read the day before. Uh, for motor skills, such as the finger drills and the Clark studies, um, you just need a time away from the skill, such as uh, 10 to 12 hours, not thinking about it, not practicing it, and just letting the brain retrace those steps. Here is a chart 
uh, from an exercise, a student was going to do a one-handed piano exercise, but the student was only going to practice one hand through the week. Um, baseline A right here, we have our trained and untrained hand. As we can see, the brain in both areas of the trained and untrained hand are very similar. After three days of practicing, the before practice, the trained hand area is a little more active than the untrained hand, but looking 20 minutes after, we can see that there is a, a great deal difference between the practicing hand and the non-practicing hand, and even so after day five. Uh, what's going on here is that the brain is saying this information is important. Um, we need to make a change so this information is more easily recallable, recalled upon. Uh, down here in section B, we retrace the weeks. And as we see from week one to week five, the pre and post practice areas, um, the difference becomes smaller. And that's from the brain actually making changes to recall the information at a much easier, at a much easier rate. So practice habits. Uh, there are two types of practice habits. Uh, we have mass practice and random practice. Um, mass practice is probably a sort of practice that many students use today where you sit down and you focus on the same aspect for, for long periods of time. The problem with this is that the average adult attention span is between 20 and 30 minutes. So if you spend an hour working on the same solo, a lot of this information that you're that you're using is not going to stick because you're just not paying attention. A more effective way to practice is random practice where you're shifting focus every 10 to 15 minutes. Maybe you work on this solo for 10 minutes, then you go to a, an etude. And maybe you have three or four things you're working on, but every 10 or 15 minutes you're changing your focus. This allows your brain to stay uh, refreshed and you really don't kind of just give in to motionless practice. Um, an interesting study I read was about um, baseball batters. Uh, batters who went to the batting cage and practiced random pitches, such as fastballs, curveballs, sinkers, uh, had better results than batters that practiced uh, pitches in blocks, such as 15 fastballs, 15 sinkers. Uh, the same was also said about basketball shooters who varied the distance of jump shots. Uh, those that varied had a better shooting percentage than the shooters that just practiced three-pointer, three-pointer, free throw, free throw, than those that went from three-point to layup to free throw. Uh, the aspects of good practice is that you have to be focused. If you're not focused when you get ready to practice, go for a walk or do something else. Because if you're not focused, what you do during that time is most likely going to be wasted. Uh, stay positive. Um, a positive attitude has um, better levels of neurotransmitters that actually help your brain form while practicing. Uh, make sure you practice correctly. Uh, incorrect practice will strengthen the incorrect neural pathways. So if you have a difficult uh, section in the solo, practice it slowly and practice it correctly instead of trying to practice it up tempo with mistakes. The mistakes will encourage the incorrect neural pathways to stick around. Uh, more important ways of practice is breaking things down, such as focusing on rhythms, then going back and focusing on, on pitches, uh, taking things out of context to, to just get another way of, of running through it. This will help increase your attention and make you stay focused. Um, at Meadow Mountain Music Camp in New York, uh, this is well known. Every summer they bring students into this camp and they're able to accomplish um, learning a mass amount of music by breaking everything down. Um, if students are caught practicing in chunks that are recognizable, they get in trouble. So they're supposed to break things down to tiny aspects where if, if an instructor were to walk by, they would not be able to understand what was going on. The game futsal for the game of soccer is a big hit right now in Europe and South America. And what futsal is, it's basically soccer with half the players on a gymnasium floor. The ball is much uh, smaller than a soccer ball. It's much tougher to dribble. Uh, the space for defenders to get away, I mean, the space for um, offensive players to get away from defensive players is limited. And everyone will touch the ball more because there's less players. 
And what this does is it translate important soccer skills to the real game of soccer. And it seems like it's much easier because the ball is easier to dribble. There's more space. You have more players that are able to, to handle the ball instead of focusing on just a handful of you. I feel this relates well to um, tuba quartets or what I call tuba band. Um, having players deal more with melody, more integral aspects of playing that, that we as tuba phony players don't see during large ensembles such as orchestra or uh, wind band playing. If you have a bad habit, um, such as learning a, a section in a solo or etude incorrectly, to fix it, do not focus on correcting the mistake. Instead, focus on learning something new and stay positive. Practice it over and over slowly and really try not to think about the mistake that was or you have built up over time, but focus on the new. Here is a clapping exercise that I want you to clap along to. So here is our, here is our quarter note. One, two, ready, go. Okay, so let's say, let's pretend that we're struggling learning this. Um, so to help teach the, the piece faster, I'm gonna tell you Think of jingle bells as the rhythm. And when you're clapping along, clap to the rhythm and use the, the lyrics for this song to correctly play this piece. So clap along again. I'm going to clap the quarter notes, but think jingle bells along the way. One, two, ready, go. Now right there, some of you may have clapped the incorrect rhythm, thinking jingle bells. What happens is that in this rhythm right here, there should be a dotted eight sixteenth, but there's not. But you clapped it wrong because you were thinking jingle bells instead of reading the music. You had kind of probably at this time zoned out and relied on the information that you had learned over time. Now let's say we were going to permanently change this rhythm and jingle bells everywhere. It would take time for people to practice it correctly to eliminate the dotted eight sixteen rhythm that we've all grown so accustomed to. So the benefits of breaking down our pieces is that we can positively focus on rhythms, uh, pitches, playing things slowly without the pressure of playing it up tempo. This all promotes good growth and great changes in our brain to recall this information down the road. Uh, studies have shown that great artists, that the ones that we look up to today, uh, have been surrounded by great artistry at an early age. So as a, as a musician, you should always try to find people or recordings that you can feed off of. And that's what happened with these great musicians that we know today is that being around us, they were able to hear and feed off of the talent around them to, to bloom. Uh, here are some books that have been more enjoyable for me to read. I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. Uh, thank you for watching today.